moderate this fantastic panel, we have with us the digital financial services specialist at IMC. Let's welcome Luis Maldonado. Welcome, Luis. Thank you so much. If you take the middle seat, thank, thank you. you. Okay. He has a great panel. Let me introduce them to them. We have the founder and CEO at Lendix, Oliver Go. Goy, thank you, Oliver. Welcome. Okay. We also have the director of Spain representative at Euronex, Susana de Antonio. Welcome, Susana. Thank you. We have the head of product management at Go Cardless, Duncan Barrigan. Welcome, Duncan. Thank you. And the investment director at Inneberry Ready, Carlos Floria. Welcome, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. OK, all yours, please. OK, thank you very much. Uh, we have here a, a, a very interesting topic. I think uh, it's been introduced to the stage the problem that is for SMEs at some point to grow. The natural trend of SME is to grow. But during the journey, you find sometimes a little bit of a bumpy ride. And for anybody having an SME, you know it's a real bumpy ride. So we have here a panel that's going to help us put some light on what we are finding on the way and what things can make our life easier or what obstacles do we have. We have, for instance, obstacles on regulation. At some point, we talk about these thresholds. Thresholds, for instance, we, we talk in Spain about the 50 uh, employees threshold where you would have some regulations that would be overloading. We talk about the lack of financing or the lack of access to investors. We talk about different things, uh, red tape or many others. So I have this uh, uh, tremendously good panel here to help us put some light on that with very different perspectives because we have an SME lending supermarket represented which has a very interesting experience, also coming from a change in regulation in France. And I will start giving the floor to Olivier to tell us a little bit how you see that. What's your point of view on this idea of growing SMEs? How, how, how is the journey for them? Uh, the journey is uh, every day easier, for <laughs> sure, uh, for a very simple reason. The, the reason is regulation, meaning just for example, we are lending marketplace dedicated to SMEs, meaning that we allow both retail investors and industry investors, sorry, to lend money directly with their iPhone to SMEs. So typically, typically, this kind of business was completely forbidden three years ago, or even two years ago in Spain. So now, thanks to a new law, opening a bridge in the bank monopoly, it's finally possible. So meaning it's a new way of financing your growth, a new way of financing SMEs. So that's completely new. Okay, that's, that's, that's great news to hear that regulation can, on, can not only be a constraint, but also a facilitator in terms of, of how, 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 how we develop. Definitely. Let, let, let's talk a little bit with, with, with Carlos Roya about uh, how an investor would see that. And, and let, give us your opinion on how do you see this, this perspective for growth for, for SMEs broadly. Well, I think um, one of the, um, the key important messages is that um, you as a startup or as a small, as a small business, uh, you have a broad range of different financing instruments uh, at your hand. So don't get too hooked on, on just the equity round, which have all the glamour, glamour in, and, and all the press in, in the news and, and all that. You, because that, that means uh, selling a, a small part of your company, and if you have to do it in several instances, you, you, you lose a significant part of your company. You have uh, public financing, you have also the bank financing, and you have also some other uh, alternatives like venture debt that would help you uh, get to your next uh, milestone in your business plan, and uh, which is transformational for your for your startup or for your company, without the full dilution that uh, equity represents. So, when you think about financing your company from the very very beginning up to until you you go uh, you you uh, go to an IPO, for instance, don't think that equity is the only option. You you have uh, plenty of different alternatives to choose. And uh, you know, uh, taking some time to optimize your your capital structure, it will it will give you uh, the opportunity to protect your your ownership in the company and, and the value that you've created. That that's great. That's a great point of view from somebody helping investors and and, and getting them access uh, to to funds. Uh, Duncan, what what was your, what's your point of view? You're, you you represent the fintech. You you working in a fintech, so you you somehow 
the other side of the coin. You, I, I'm sure you, you, you've gone searching for financing and, and, and I'm sure you, you will expect to have more rounds. What, what's your experience from, from your own point of view or how do you see this idea of uh, obstacles or facilitators for growth for SMEs? So what we do at GoCard is we're a recurring payments business. So we're building a global network, joining together direct debit around the world so that you can collect payments from anywhere to anywhere in any currency. And from a, from a small and medium business perspective ourselves, we help businesses of all sizes, but around 30,000 SMEs from across Europe to collect payments. I think that the things that we see, the things that get in their way, it's, it's really all about time. So that's the, the time that they have and the, the limited time in the day for them to, to do the things they want to do. And it's about getting paid on time. So we see a lot of businesses, they, they just want payments to happen. They want payments to be invisible. They, they don't want to spend any time on it. But what happens instead is that they end up spending countless hours chasing invoices, sending invoices, or they spend a fortune on, on card fees. So what we do uh, to, to solve that problem for them is that we provide a really easy, set, easy to set up way for them to just get paid uh, on time, every time. The, the average customer ends up saving about three weeks of time and, and a couple of thousand euros. So uh, really what that means and, and what I think the, the biggest obstacle that we help overcome for, for growth is that it's giving them that time back to invest in the business and, uh, and help them to grow. So that time they can devote it to, to, to other core uh, areas that would help them grow. Exactly. Right. Now everyone okay. wants to build a great product and a great service for their customers. They don't want to spend time on anything else. And we, we just want to get out of the way so that you can spend the time on that instead. Great. Okay, uh, Susanna, uh, from, from Euronext, uh, I mean, uh, you, you are in, in capital markets. Yeah. How do you see this perspective of, of SME's uh, perspectives of growth and how they can scale up better? Or, or what, what's your own experience or your vision? Well, I think uh, capital markets is a very attractive uh, opportunity and it's an alternative that in the case of Spanish companies has not been uh, used uh, regularly uh, uh, over the last few years. But in the case of uh, Euronext, we are the leading pan-European capital markets operator. We operate the markets in Paris, Amsterdam, Brussels and Lisbon. And uh, we have a strong focus on uh, giving uh, SMEs access to capital markets, uh, starting from very small sizes. And, uh, and, and also we have a strong focus on technology. So, uh, so for example, we have a, 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 an alternative market focused on growth companies, and we have around 200 companies listed there, and some of them have uh, market caps, so valuation below 50 million. So, uh, so, uh, so we are a very, a very interesting uh, way to, uh, to finance uh, growth uh, uh, in, in, in coming years, in, uh, especially for those companies which are s scaling up and, uh, and want to keep independence instead of having uh, maybe sometimes different uh, uh, venture capitals in their, in their boards that have maybe different opinions. So they, can, they are able to uh, keep independence, have uh, access to international investors and, and a lot of visibility in the market. So it's, uh, It's an alternative with a lot of uh, advantages, uh, and, and, and in our case, we, we are open to, uh, to SMEs. Okay, so we've seen a great share of different perspectives and, and ways uh, that SMEs can approach to actually get, get, get financing. And some do work better in some places or, or, or other. Oliver was mentioning that regulation, he, he's happy with the regulation and it's played well uh, for, for, your, for your own company. But SMEs, uh, marketplaces, are working and, and have grown fast in, in the UK and, and, and in the US. Is it the same case for the rest of Europe? I mean, do you see differences uh, across uh, in countries or areas depending on, on how regulation has been playing? Or, or, or there are other reasons why they don't develop? Uh, so far, we know that the same growth than platform have known in the UK or in the US at their own very beginning. But we have to admit that our main challenge on a daily basis is not to convince lenders to come on the platform and to lend money to SMEs. Our main challenge is to convince SMEs to come on the platforms to borrow money. It may seem very strange, but for the same reason, when you are a startup, you always think to venture capital fund, as you mentioned. You do not think about alternative funding. And that's almost the same for SMEs. When they are looking for money, they think they have only one thing in mind, the bank. So they, they are not, still not aware of the additional possibility they have. So our main challenge to them, that's why I'm quite happy to be on stage to explain it, is that if you are running an SME, think, let's say be open-minded, think <laughs> outside of the box, and you have other way of finance your growth 
uh, and bank is not the only solution. It's a good solution, but it's not the only solution for sure. And that's exactly the same when you're running a startup. Yeah, Dwell, dwelling on, on that, uh, Carlos, when, when do you see, I mean, that uh, you said that SMEs have to consider different options. I mean, when do you see, how do you advise an SME, what is the right moment actually to go into different tranches of equity and the dilution that it means? How do you see, how do you see that the path should be considered? What, what, what's the thinking that you think would be the most uh, rational approach from an SME point of view? Um, I think um, a lot of uh, startups, um, ironically, um, they, they don't like public funding. Um, and I think that that would be the, the first uh, thing to look at. Um, <clears throat> a, a lot of money is, is given uh, through grants and also through like soft loans, which, which uh, practically don't have any, any interest on that. Um, you need to maximize that. Uh, that's available uh, from the uh, national government and from the state, and, and, and you need to maximize that because that, that's very advantageous for, for yourself. No? Obviously, uh, that's limited, and uh, when, you are, when you are growing, and particularly in the early stages, um, the uh, company needs to be funded with, with equity, uh, so you have a strong balance sheet. But as your company grows and uh, starts to enter a new growth phase, uh, once you have recurrent revenues and, and, and your business model is validated, you, 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 you need to start looking at some other alternatives, uh, like um, banking uh, and some other uh, like uh, credit loans and, and factoring and reverse factoring, just uh, different uh, tools that, that are out there that could help you manage your cash and, and and optimize your, your capital structure. Obviously, um, one of the, 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 the banking world is a, is a tough one, and uh, that, that is why the uh, venture debt is also an, an opportunity in the States, in, in the UK, in some other regions in Europe, and, and from, from some years now uh, here also in Spain, that helps those companies um, you know, bridge that, that area between your company starting to make in uh, positive EVTA or profits, but uh, not, not, not ready still to, to be banked by a normal standard bank, you could use uh, Venture Debt to bridge that time and reach to that phase that uh, you could be more more uh, target for the uh, banking system. So there are loads of different tools out there. Just uh, try to think what's best in, in for your company at, uh, at any, po any given time. Uh, Bearing in mind that equity, which is a very, very attractive and a very good uh, alternative, is the, the, the most expensive one. Uh, Susana, any, any, any reaction to that? I mean, where do you see that the, the, they fit actually cap capital markets in, in this uh, uh, approach and, and, and at what stages? We're talking about the most early stages and so on when, when, when equity is, would be reasonable. When do you think? that uh, uh, capital markets should, should be taken into consideration? I think capital markets should be taken into consideration starting, I would say, it depends from uh, company to company and from a startup to another, but I could say starting in round, round B, for example, so, I, and, uh, and it's uh, at that moment when I think that the startups face more difficulties in, in raising uh, capital, because uh, at least in Spain we have a lot of uh, funds uh, uh, covering the seed capital on very early stages but when we are when we are talking the, to uh, you know uh, some uh, some uh, you know later stages uh, when they are planning to raise i would say around 10 million or so 10 15 million uh, starting from that it becomes more difficult to get the money from venture capitals and uh, and of course those startups don't have access to bank financing uh, at those stages normally so uh, i think that's a very good point to consider an IPO in for example in our markets we have a the minimum size uh, uh, transaction size is 2.5 million so it's very small uh, I could say that a successful IPO would start at around 10 million or 7 10 million so I think that point would be uh, the, the right one to start considering uh, an access to uh, to markets Olivier or Duncan any 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 reaction or any comment from that from your own perspective going to, to finance your, yourself so sorry Myself, uh, let's say, as, as a CEO of a startup, sorry to say that uh, like this, but I disagree. It's from, from <laughs> <laughs> sorry to be honest, but if you are looking to raise 2.5 million euros, uh, you, you can go, uh, you can be listed. It's too, too early. We have raised yeah, yeah, 90 million euros, so, and, and we are still private, and, and I think it's a good news. 
I think you can go public as soon as you have validate, validated your model, as soon as you know pretty well your metrics, your KPI, and everything. Otherwise, you will disappoint the market. So I, I prefer to wait a little bit more before going yeah. too early uh, uh, on the listed market. I think it's more a question of revenue uh, than a, a question of the amount you're looking for. And even if you do not have enough venture capital funds covering, let's say, Series B and C in Spain, I'm really sure that you have a lot of foreign funds interested in, in, in Spanish startup for sure. And we have the same situation in France too. We have, let's say, maybe more venture capital funds than you have in Spain. But nevertheless, we have also a lot of uh, players coming from the UK or coming from the US, and they are pretty active and they invest in startups a lot. So I, I think that you, if you are only looking for 2.5, even if no, 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 yeah, yeah, that but... you, you start at 2.5, it's too early for me. Yeah, that's but basically no. what I said. Two point mm. five is the theoretical. But, but is, even, is, is 10, our, even ten. No, no, I disagree. I disagree. So we <laughs> have. Right so we have a lot of examples of uh, startups and companies that have raised ten million mm. and are very successful in the market. By the way, we have a Spanish company, uh, Antevenio, listed in our market. Mm. Uh, they did an IPO in, back in two thousand and seven, uh, and seven, so ten years ago. It's a company with a 30 million market cap, and they raised 8 million. They are pretty happy mm -hmm. in, in Paris. They have liquidity, access to international investors, and they, they have now an international perspective. So mm -hmm. we have a, a lot of examples of that size. I agree that 2.5 is uh, too small, and that's what I said. Mm -hmm. I, I would consider starting in, uh, with 10 million. And of course, what is uh, a requirement, but for an IPO, uh, for a private round, is to have a solid uh, business plan, uh, business case, uh, and of course, a good management team. So that's critical, of course. But we were discussing in terms of size. Mm. But um, we can, uh, I can give you more examples if you want. To okay. it's, nice, it's, it's nice we have, we have, we have disagreements on the panel. Uh, Duca, do you have any, any, any views on that? I mean, uh, from our side, we're kind of the opposite in, in all of a sense. So we raised 23 million US this year, and we did it from our own board members and, and their funds. So we kind of, <laughs> kind of went the opposite <laughs> way. But so you're on the fringe <laughs> of family and board members uh, round, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, from their funds, of course, okay. than their own personal. But I, I thought there was something interesting Carlos said, in that the, one of the things that I see, having come from a bit more of a, a broader investment background before I came into tech, is that I think not enough startups consider the different cost of capital in the different ways that you get it. So pe people won't compare the fact that there is a cost of capital to equity and there's a cost of capital to debt and there's a cost of capital to you know, optimizing your cash flow, for instance. Mm. Uh, so I think it, it kind of a bit more of that broader thinking about the different ways in which you can finance a business would actually help uh, all, all startups and small businesses to figure out the best way of doing it, which can be a different one depending on the different situation. On, on, on these alternative ways of, of, of financing, uh, and, and coming back to the idea of uh, avoiding dilution, uh, uh, both uh, Carlos and Oliver, can, can you give me a little bit more of, of, of your insights on actually whether a marketplace can actually serve as, as, as an alternative mean to avoid dilution, on whether there are other alternative financing? You've mentioned some of them, and, and, and some way that, they, that the SMEs have to think about and how they approach investors. But can we? Talk a little bit more about how to somehow uh, avoid the problem at the very early stages of, of avoiding the dilution, Carlos, and then maybe Olivier. Yeah, v valuation is not everything for sure. Uh, meaning that very often when I'm discussing with friends and they're running startups, they are only concentrated on valuation when they're organizing a new round of financing. And for sure, uh, they, they should look at the condition attached to the wrong, meaning. Will it be a, a common share or preferred share? And, and, and I think it's the key. And, and I have to admit that when you're public, you have only common share. So it's definitely bet, better than a preferred share. I don't know if, if everybody here knows what preferred shares are, but definitely when you're, you can have a very high valuation, but a, a, a preferred at 2x, and that's just a nightmare for, for your next one. So o always consider both valuation, but also attached condition, and generally speaking, the, the, the war as, a, as one thing. So I, I think that's the main challenge when you're rising and you want. OK, Carlos. I think it's, um, it's like a fine art, because um, obviously, uh, at some point, you, you will need to dilute. But uh, you have like 100% of your company, and that you, you, you cannot sell um, a large piece of the, of, the, of the cake too early, because Otherwise, you know, at some point you won't have <coughs> a strong interest on continuing with, with the venture. No? 
but uh, so you, you need to balance that. But on, on the other hand, um, you need you need to raise you need to raise uh, funding to to your company to to grow in value. So um, you you need, you need to understand that I mean if you ask for a, a very high valuation, that might be the end of your startup because if you don't uh, live up to the expectations, the next round should be significantly higher in value. And if you you are not able to deliver that, that means no you you won't get any funding um, going forward. So. It's a fine art between not giving up too much of your of your ownership and also um, uh, trying to not to uh, sell to um, or to overestimate your your valuation. That that is why so that it's so important to look at some other funding alternative which are less expensive in terms of dilution, which are uh, public funding, venture debt, and and some other. Banking uh, tools that uh, might not be banks might not be willing to lend you on a long-term basis, but there's always credit lines, uh, working capital lines, uh, factoring, and all these uh, instruments that could help uh, f uh, fund your your startup without giving too much um, giving too much of your equity and you know allowing uh, allowing the company to grow to a stage where the valuation is uh, fully fundamental and it's and it's solid. So. Uh, it's not a matter of, you know, uh, my company is valued 20, 20 million. It's just a matter that if everyone else in the um, in the ecosystem believes that those 20 million are are deserved, and especially if you have a full ratchet, meaning that if you experience a down round after yeah. a, after a, a, a round with full ratchet, it will be just the end of your company and yeah. a nightmare. Okay, we, we have focused a lot on, 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 on financing, on, on, on what are the constraints or the ways of uh, uh, phase financing. Let's move on a little bit for, 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 for the few minutes with that we have left to other issues that relate to growth of, of SMEs. Uh, Duncan, can you give us your experience on, for instance, you're, you're on the business of payments. I mean, and you probably have seen uh, failures uh, and successes. What can you uh, bring here as a learning of m common mistakes that uh, SMEs can make in your own field that otherwise would have helped them grow more? I mean, can you bring us s something on that? And, and we will focus o on the rest on, I mean, o what are the constraints do you see on, on, on growing aside from financing? I, I, I'll go around on, on, on for, for, for the rest on that, but if you can jump on this idea so that we won't move from, from financing. So I think one of the things we see is that payments get neglected. And it, it's understandable why that's the case, because people, you know, as we've said, are, are focused on growing the business. But it, it's actually really easy to make them work better. And they're more of an obstacle than you might think. I, I saw a survey recently that said that a third of businesses in Spain would hire more employees if they could collect payments faster, and that half of them put getting their payments on time as a, as a major constraint on their growth. So pe people look at that, but they end up in this cycle where they don't do anything about it because they think it's more complicated. When really, the, there's so many ways now, you know, including ourselves, where you can connect your accounting software. You can connect the, the core business software you're using anyway to payments. And you can actually solve a lot of that problem without a tremendous amount of effort. So I get why people who are starting new businesses don't necessarily think about it that much. It doesn't feel like a focus. But it, 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 a common mistake is you just, you just don't put that small amount of time to get you know, your payments connected to your accounting software or whatever that then takes that out of the way and allows you to get on with everything else. Okay. Susanna, I mean, do you have any insight on that? I mean, what constraints have you seen that uh, face SMEs to grow, aside, of course, from, from accessing finance uh, yeah, through yeah. down yeah. the road? I think that based on my previous experience, I would say that uh, uh, the, the capacity to attract talent, it's, a, it's an important factor that sometimes is a problem for SMEs because they are not able to, um, in, because, uh, you know, the size of the business or the prospects, uh, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, good talent have other opportunities or have uh, the opportunity to go abroad, to go for, to work for a, a unicorn or a large corporation. So I think uh, that's a, that's a, 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 an issue that some companies are facing. And, and going back to uh, to, uh, to finance to the public uh, uh, public markets, I think having a company listed makes it more attractive for uh, for uh, for key talent because it's a more promising company. They, ha they could have some incentives in terms of uh, shares and so on. So I think it's a, it's a good way to, uh, to, uh, to be able to, uh, to attract key people. 
Okay. Your, your thoughts on that, Oliveira? Any, any constraints that you think? I agree. I agree. <laughs> you Thanks. Think, you Thanks. Agree. <laughs> you said you agree. You said you agree. Okay. I that's that's one at the table. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, that's fine. And Carlos? <laughs> well, we, we see some, some standard problems, like uh, when you reach uh, 50 employees, then you know, companies um, start to get into a different phase, and, and um, management teams are not that comfortable uh, managing that. that size of their, uh, of their company. Um, you also have issues in internationalization. Spain is not very good at that traditionally, uh, leaving aside the uh, LATAM. Uh, but in terms of, of, uh, of financing, um, I would recommend uh, to try to have a financing plan in place uh, and that you look that your company is well funded from way beyond the issues um, would arise. Because if you go to an investor or you go to a bank or you go uh, to uh, an alternative uh, financier um, with, with urgency and needs, because either you get this money or next month you won't be able to pay the uh, salaries or in two months, that, that's, that's a very, very um, bad impression. Even though your company might be a good one, but uh, you, 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 you didn't have the time to understand that you might be running out of money in six months down the line. So keep, you know, try to uh, find all those liquidity pools that are available in the market to have your startup well funded um, before you run into issues uh, quite early. OK, with this tip, I think we have to wrap up here. I just thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and your insights into, into, this, into this arena. And I think we have learned something on how not to make mistakes and how to approach the growth for SMEs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Thank you, Luis Maldonado and his panel. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to ask you to leave. Thank you. That was very kind, Luis. I, I, I think, you, I, I think I, you saw me and you knew you had to go. That's what people do when they saw me.